pleasure um, to be with you today. Uh, long ago, I was on the faculty of the Naval War College as a SECNAV fellow and, uh, and have um, fond memories of, uh, of that year here. I also, um, because Fletcher School uh, educates doctoral students as well as master's students, um, I have um, several former doctoral students who, who teach right up the hill here. And, and I went in the bookstore and I happened to see the book of, uh, of one of those students, Toshi, two of them actually, Toshi Yoshihara and, uh, and Jim Holmes, Red Star uh, Over the Pacific, which is about the Chinese Navy. What I'm going to um, talk to you about today, have a conversation with you, um, is about uh, uh, the Marine Corps counterinsurgency campaign in Iraq. Uh, in the period 2004 to 2008. And um, I always like to begin uh, talking uh, about my book um, by saying what it's not. Uh, and um, it is, uh, it's not a book on the entire war. Uh, it's not um, about how the war was fought everywhere. And, uh, and it uh, doesn't deal with the rationale for the war. I'm happy to talk about all those things. But, um, but the book is about Marines, and, uh, and, and it's at the operational level, and I, I know many of you are familiar with this concept of, of the operational level and the strategy level. Uh, the study um, raises, it's, from an you know, academic point of view, um, the question that I tried to uh, deal with is, um, is how the Marines were able to learn during war, and uh, and and what um, what the the writing on military organizations at war and organizations in general is that uh, that they don't learn fast, uh, and uh, and especially this is said of military organizations that they don't learn quickly. Yet the Marines uh, were able to learn uh, in uh, in a very short period. And so the theme of the book is what John said, and that is how the Marines adapted their operations and their strategy to a context in which um, they were not prepared. Uh, I'll, I'll say something about the, uh, the operational plan uh, that the Marines took with them in 2004, but um, the reality uh, is that in 2004, when the Marine Corps prepared to go back uh, to Iraq. They had been in Iraq as part of the march up, uh, and uh, uh, after um, the Iraqi regime was toppled, the Marines um, redeployed to the southern part of Iraq. This is the Shia area, and it was a pretty peaceful time. This would be from um, the late in the spring of 2003 until the fall of 2003 when most of the Marines were out of, uh, out of uh, Iraq. So that period for them was, was rather tranquil. And, uh, and in many ways, it, uh, it had an impact on what they thought they would find when they went back to Iraq. So uh, what, uh, what I'm going to do is, is talk uh, about that campaign. I, I sometimes like to begin by by commenting on this issue of organizational learning. I won't go into that in, uh, in much detail. This is uh, uh, more uh, uh, for, for um, teaching my students. Uh, I won't uh, bore you with organizational theory, except to say that uh, it can be very boring. Uh, <laughs> uh, as frankly um, uh, can, uh, can most uh, uh, most uh, writing in, uh, in, in, uh, in some parts of academia. Um, the, the Marine Corps uh, says that it's a learning organization. Uh, this is part of their, uh, the way that they, uh, they think about themselves. And uh, in many ways, I would say that uh, the Marine Corps has to be a learning organization because uh, often, uh, it, uh, it will find itself uh, first uh, in the fight. And um, uh, so the Marine Corps, in, in many ways, at least my uh, study of the Marine Corps, 
they assume that they will find themselves initially engaged without a clear understanding of the context uh, and, and the enemy that they're, they're facing. Uh, Victor Krulak, who wrote this um, book that I think every Marine has to read, uh, First to Fight. I have not yet met a Marine officer who's come to study at the Fletcher School with me who hasn't read it. I ask every one of them when they arrive, have you read First to Fight? Of course, is the answer. Uh, well, uh, Victor Krulak uh, said uh, that uh, the, uh, the war you prepare for is rarely the war you get. And uh, as a result, uh, Marines have to um, be ready for uh, uncertainty. And, uh, and, and this, um, in my study of the Marine Corps, um, seems to be embedded in Marine Corps organizational culture. Um, what, uh, and so the narrative, the story I tell, is, uh, is that of, of learning and, and adapting uh, in a situation that was very different than uh, the experience the Marines had when they were part of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, the march up to Baghdad, and the toppling of the regime. So what I'm going to do is, is pick up uh, the narrative uh, with um, with how the Marines prepared uh, to go to Anbar and, and what they accepted. And I'll talk about the campaign some. And then um, it might be uh, more fun for all of us if, um, if we you know, chat about uh, this, uh, this campaign after I uh, lay out uh, some of the, the, the specific findings. I would uh, now, one thing I, I would um, uh, tell you, you might wonder, how is it that I came to do this? After all, I'm an academic from Boston. You know, what am I doing uh, with the Marine Corps? Um, in addition to uh, teaching at the Naval War College, um, uh, in the late uh, 90s, I held a chair uh, with the Marine Corps. Uh, it's called the Oppenheimer Chair. And I spent a year uh, at Quantico. And, uh, and when I was there, I got to know very well um, General Don Gardner, uh, who, at the t uh, who uh, was the, uh, the president of, uh, of the schools of Quantico, and we became very good friends. Um, I, at that time, was writing a book uh, entitled The Secret War Against Hanoi, and it was the, the story of, um, of the covert action campaign that was conducted against North Vietnam uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, by an organization called MACV SOG. Some of you may have heard of this uh, organization. Not necessarily the book, but the organization. And, and, and General Gardner and I got to be quite good friends, and um, I gave a series of lectures on this book, and then I did another book uh, in, uh, in the, uh, around, I think it was published around 2006, uh, called, uh, titled Insurgents, Terrorists, and Militias, uh, the, the warriors of modern uh, combat, and uh, and he uh, invited me down to uh, to talk about that, and um, and so we, we developed this friendship. And uh, around 2008, we were having lunch, and um, he uh, we were talking about Iraq, and I, I said to him, I said, you know, it's very interesting all of the uh, uh, discussion about the surge. The surge was going on at that time. You all know about the surge and General Petraeus and the development of uh, the counterinsurgency, uh, new counterinsurgency doctrine. And, uh, and, and what was interesting to me was that, that the Marine Corps uh, in Anbar uh, carried out a counterinsurgency campaign that looked exactly like the surge um, before the surge took place, but didn't really get much credit for it. And, um, and so I raised this, and, and he asked how I would study it, and I uh, gave him some ideas about what kind of material I'd like to have access to. I found out that the, um, the Marine Corps does an excellent job of, um, of doing what I call the moral histories, you would probably call them debriefings. But when a, 
when a MEF comes out, when a Marine Expeditionary Force comes out of a deployment in Iraq, uh, there is uh, the, the Marine historians uh, interview uh, all the, the key officers to capture uh, what, uh, what they did there. And, um, and then, of course, uh, there are uh, uh, the, the kind of normal uh, unit reports and so on that are available. And, and I said uh, to General Gardner that I'd like to have access to all of that. And uh, he said, okay. So uh, that's, uh, that's how I, I uh, decided to, uh, to work on this topic. And, um, and so what did I find? Well, I found that, um, that when the, the Marines um, prepared uh, to, uh, to go back to Iraq in, uh, in, in March of 2004, uh, they were going to send um, part of one MEF, uh, so part of uh, uh, the uh, first Marine Expeditionary Force, um, that, um, that their assessment of what they expected to find there what can be uh, 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 characterized as a generally permissive environment. Um, now this is, uh, uh, they're, they're preparing uh, their, um, their operational plan in the late fall and, uh, uh, and, and right after, the, in the late fall of 2003. And um, uh, uh, I uh, interviewed the, um, the uh, uh, head of intelligence for the MEF, uh, who, who said at the time, uh, ANBAR, which is in the news now, as you know, quite a bit, uh, uh, is generally permissive, meaning that uh, we don't expect much of a fight, although there are pockets of resistance. Uh, but um, the, the campaign plan for one MEF uh, essentially uh, expected um, uh, to, uh, to enter a a relatively benign environment. Then Colonel Joe Dunford, of course uh, many of you will know the name uh, Joe Dunford, uh, he's now the ISAF commander in Afghanistan, uh, yeah. now General Dunford. I knew him when he was Major Dunford. Um, he studied with me at the Fletcher School. Uh, Joe said at that time, he was the, um, the uh, uh, first uh, Marine Division's chief of staff and uh, he, uh, he was involved in the planning for this deployment. And he said uh, uh, in the uh, interview, um, we, were not, uh, we were not talking about an insurgency at that point. The word insurgency wasn't used uh, early in 2004. And so based on, on these suppositions, one MEF drew up uh, a, a campaign, campaign plan for AMBAR that essentially looked at Anbar as being in a post-conflict phase. So, you know, war was over, uh, this was uh, post-conflict. Um, uh, the campaign plan, uh, once, uh, once the one MEF uh, arrived in Anbar, uh, they found uh, quickly that the situation was much different. Now, how do we account for this uh, bad, uh, bad assessment of the situation? And, and it, it really goes to um, how, uh, how little um, the American intelligence community knew about uh, AMBAR and, and about Iraq in general. And, uh, and, and also the fact that uh, there, was, uh, there was nothing uh, in, in Department of Defense planning and CENTCOM planning uh, that, that ever thought that there could be what I like to call a war after the war. See, they planned for the, the conventional war, but could there be a war after the war? And that idea uh, was not part of, uh, of, uh, of the, the way the, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, oh, uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, or uh, the intelligence community um, uh, thought about uh, the possibility that there could be a war after the war, an irregular war, an insurgency, terrorism, and so on. So the Marines found themselves in another one of those un, un, unforeseen conflicts. That's what General Krulak says. Now, you're going to get there, and it's, you're probably not going to uh, uh, be prepared for it. And, uh, and the situation uh, at the end of 2004 
in Amhar was not good for the Marine Corps. They had uh, uh, carried, they had won a major battle. This was the Battle of Fallujah, and I talk about Fallujah and, and, and what went uh, right there, and, and, uh, and it's a very interesting battle. But in terms of dealing with a growing insurgency, uh, the Marine Corps um, was locked in, uh, you know, that old game called whack-a-mole. You know, whack-a-mole, something pops up, you whack it, and it comes up over here. And, and, and that's what they were locked in in 2004 and, uh, and, and coming into 2005. They have enough forces. Uh, uh, there were about the, the MEF, which included uh, an army uh, brigade, it was about 25,000. And Ambar is a big place. And so they, they, didn't, they could, when they found insurgents, they could eliminate them, but they couldn't hold the ground. And the, and the problem was that they needed to be able uh, to hold the ground. So uh, they come into uh, 2005, uh, and it, it's uh, at this, it, 2005 is one of these important learning, uh, I call it learning junctures, learning points uh, for, uh, for uh, the, the Marine Corps. Uh, one MEF, uh, uh, two MEF replaces one MEF, and um, uh, in, uh, in this period of, uh, of 2005, um, the Marine Corps um, uh, gains uh, ground truth about uh, what's the nature of, uh, of the enemy here that we're fighting, what's the nature of the adversary. And, um, and, and what's interesting uh, is that uh, uh, they, uh, they, they, they come to understand that this insurgency uh, is not, uh, uh, you can't think of it as, uh, as made, made up of just one perspective or one element. But, um, but the insurgency is really a coalition, it's an interesting coalition uh, of, uh, now this is an Ambar, so um, this is all Sunni, no, no Shia here, it's all Sunni area. Um, and uh, the insurgency is, is made up in part of what I would call uh, Sunni nationalists. These are uh, some of them former regime members, members of the army, uh, who, um, who saw uh, the U.S. Um, intervention and then uh, the empowering of the Shia leadership in Baghdad uh, as, uh, as a great loss for themselves. And, and they, uh, organizing to fight against uh, American presence. Uh, there, there are also, uh, in uh, Anbar at this time, there's a large uh, influx of, uh, of internationalists. These are um, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, members or uh, men who identify with Al-Qaeda. And, uh, and, and, and Iraq, and especially this Anbar region for, uh, for Al-Qaeda, uh, had become the central front in, in the global fight. Now, that, you know, this, is, um, this Al-Qaeda organization believes they're in a global war, and, uh, and, and, uh, and with the U.S. Um, uh, intervention in Iraq, uh, they saw this as opportunity. In, in their narrative, they, they they hoped um, to be able to inflict on the U.S. Uh, what they believed was the, uh, the defeat that they inflicted on the, the Soviet Red Army uh, in Afghanistan. Now, this is a narrative that uh, the, who beat the Red Army in Afghanistan were not uh, internationalists from, from different parts of the Muslim world, but Afghans. But nevertheless, they have this narrative, and, and so their narrative was that uh, uh, Iraq uh, could be this central front. And so you have the, they're sometimes called Salafis, you have these uh, jihadis who uh, are showing up in Anbar and, uh, and elsewhere in Iraq. Uh, there are Iraqis who uh, adhere to this point of view as well. And they form a coalition. Often insurgencies are coalitions. They're not made up of just one faction. And, um, and uh, that can be their weakness. This can be their weakness. Now, <laughs> what happens uh, 
in uh, in uh, in Ambar is uh, in uh, in at the end of 2004, uh, early 2005, uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq and and, in, and they're one of the factions now in this insurgency in Ambar. They want to take control of uh, of the insurgency, so they. Uh, uh, they're in a partnership, but now uh, they want to uh, they want to take over uh, because they see uh, this fight in Iraq in a global sense. Um, the the now to take uh, uh, take control of it, of course, the the nationalist elements aren't necessarily in agreement with this. And I, I should step back and say that um, the the the. The insurgency worked in 2004 and, and into 2005 because there was this common enemy, which was the United States. Um, but uh, the, the other than that, uh, the, these different elements of the insurgency were what I like to call um, unnatural partners. They were unnatural partners. Uh, on many things, there was big disagreement between these internationalists and, and local uh, local uh, uh, Sunni sheikhs and tribesmen. And when al-Qaeda made this power play uh, to take over the insurgency, um, it, uh, it created pushback from, uh, from uh, the nationalist elements of the insurgency. And uh, al-Qaeda, in order to, um, to enforce their, uh, their will, uh, in, uh, initiated a murder and intimidation campaign, uh, especially against sheikhs, uh, uh, sheikhs that uh, were, uh, were resisting their, their domination. Uh, they would murder them and their families too. Now, this is a bad idea in tribal society uh, because uh, tribal societies, uh, sheikhs are very important. And uh, if you murder a sheikh, uh, uh, you're likely to get the whole tribe coming after you. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I can uh, uh, say that uh, what, uh, what this murder and intimidation campaign did was it, it led some of these sheikhs to start to look elsewhere for help. And, and, um, uh, and, and so uh, in, uh, in, in 2005, um, Two MEF, which has now replaced one MEF, um, they uh, they begin to have conversations with uh, with some of the uh, the, the tribal uh, leaders, uh, uh, sheikhs, and 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 the marine leadership um, comes to the view that if we can get some of these uh, tribes uh, to provide uh, men uh, to us. Um, we'll be able not just to find insurgents and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and kill them, but we'll be able to hold ground. And in counterinsurgency, it's very important to hold ground and to extend out. Some uh, compare this to uh, dropping a, a drop of oil on a cloth, and you'll see it expand. And, and this, is, uh, this is true in counterinsurgency. If in a counterinsurgency uh, uh, you are simply uh, clearing areas uh, but not holding them, then they'll come back. They'll come back. The insurgents will come back. And so you have to be able to, uh, to not just clear, uh, but you, you need to be able to hold. This is um, the nature of war uh, when it takes this irregular, uh, unconventional form. And, um, and so in Iraq and in, in Anbar, uh, it was uh, what I call population-centric warfare. And, uh, and so if you can uh, gain uh, support in, in local areas, uh, it will, uh, it will uh, be a force multiplier. Now, the, what, the, of course, the Marine Corps um, had to do uh, was to be able to uh, understand who these tribes were, uh, and uh, and work with them, uh, and uh, so in the in this uh, fall of 2005, uh, the Marine Corps leadership in Ambar began to um, 
uh, have uh, discussions uh, with these uh, tribal uh, sheikhs. This is the origins of what's called the awakening. You probably have, some of you have probably heard that term, the Anbar awakening, uh, the Sunni awakening, uh, which um, often is identified with the surge, which comes uh, in, uh, the surge begins in the spring of 2007. But the Marine Corps uh, uh, was uh, uh, involved with the awakening before it was actually called the awakening, but uh, these, uh, uh, these sheikhs uh, that, uh, that became part of the awakening, which was to resist uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and, and, uh, and, and the insurgency. Uh, so, um, in 2005 then, one would say that the Marines recognized an opportunity. Uh, there was an opportunity, the insurgency was fragmenting, and this opened the door for this opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, began uh, in November and December meetings uh, between the, the two MEF leadership, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the le uh, some of the most important uh, tribal sheikhs in Ambar. This is an important, another one of these important learning points, or I call them learning junctures. Uh, now, uh, of course, what the, the Marines recognized was that uh, in order to engage uh, with uh, with the, uh, the, the sheikhs and the tribes, that they were going to have to build this into their operational plan. And, and so what's very interesting is how uh, what TUMEF was learning in 2005 was, was coming back to one MEF, which was preparing to go back in 2006. And, and the cycle of learning here is very interesting. Uh, and, and, uh, and it has uh, a, an important impact on uh, one MEF's uh, plan uh, for 2006. And, and so uh, the Marine uh, one MEF returns to, uh, to Iraq uh, in 2006. Now this is the most interesting year. And, uh, and let me uh, comment uh, a bit on this year. Um, uh, many thought, including uh, uh, some uh, important uh, members of marine intelligence, uh, that Ambar was lost, uh, that uh, uh, the Marines uh, had lost Ambar, and, uh, and, 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 and that was that. Um, this was at a time when, uh, when one MEF, uh, was going back uh, back to Anbar with a new operational plan that sought to capitalize on the engagement that was taking place between uh, the Marine leadership in Iraq at that time and uh, the, uh, uh, the the tribal uh, leadership, uh, some of the key uh, tribes uh, in Anbar. So you have this uh, ironic situation. On the one hand, you know the the, the one narrative, Ambar's lost, uh, and 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 another narrative, which is the narrative that I I wrote about and and, and others have written about, uh, and that is that that um, uh, because of uh, of this understanding of the environment, um, the the Marine Corps developed. Uh, uh, a, a new approach for uh, 2006. It's a classic counterinsurgency approach, but in which engagement with, uh, with uh, the, the tribes of, uh, of, of Anbar is seen as that important force multiplier. If you can get uh, large numbers of tribesmen to serve in the Iraqi or the Anbar police, um, you'll be able to uh, expand uh, your control over Anbar. And as you do that, you will, uh, you will uh, 
take, uh, take control of the insurgency. And, uh, and so um, this tribal engagement uh, became uh, a very important part uh, of, um, of, of what the Marines uh, did uh, in Ambar in 2006. And, and the story of 2006 in, in Ambar is how one MEF executed this campaign plan and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and really turned, uh, turned the tide, if you will, uh, in, uh, in that part of, uh, of the, 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 the war after the war in Iraq. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, what's interesting is that uh, it, as 2007 begins, uh, in, in, in March and April of 2007, this is just as the surge is taking place in the Baghdad area and, 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 and the army is, uh, is adapting and, and employing this kind of counterinsurgency approach. The, the, the fight in Anbar uh, drops uh, precipitously. The number of acts of violence and so on go down quite a bit. And, um, and, and that's a key turning point. I interviewed um, General John Allen and others who were the, the commanders of, uh, of, uh, of TUMEF that went back in 2007. And, um, and, and uh, uh, they, uh, they didn't know when it was going to happen. Uh, you know, war is not a science. Some people try to think it is, but it's more art than a science. But uh, they were ready so that <clears throat> when, when this violence did come down, then, uh, then they, could, uh, they could capitalize on it and, uh, and help uh, move the awakening uh, into... Um, into uh, a, uh, a consolidation period. Uh, so um, uh, this is the story of Anwar. It, it's an important part of the war. Uh, it, um, it was a, a success at the operational level. Uh, uh, it was not, uh, uh, and, it, and it focused on uh, a, a particular part of the fight. And uh, uh, now, of course, we see that uh, that Ambar uh, is in the news quite a bit. Um, the dean at the Fletcher School, um, uh, Jim Stavridis, our, 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 our new dean, is former SACUR, and uh, <coughs> Admiral Stavridis uh, said to me the other day that I have to write a sequel, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda <coughs> takes Ambar back. Um, that's not a happy story. Um, and I can comment on that. But this is what uh, the book's about. It's about uh, the Marine Corps and counterinsurgency and how uh, the Marine Corps, uh, in this particular instance uh, in Iraq, uh, proved uh, to be quite a, an adaptive organization that, uh, that came to understand uh, the, uh, the adversary. They didn't understand them going in. They figured it out. Uh, and, uh, and they were quite successful at the operational level. This uh, was not, you know, US po overall U.S. policy in Iraq. That's another story. So I'll, I'll stop with that uh, and, um, and happy to um, have a conversation with you uh, about, um, about this and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Iraq more broadly, if, uh, if you would like. Thank you. Please. Yes. Yeah, you offered a great uh, insight into the politics, really, of, of the taking of Anbar. I'd always saw it as a tactical victory for the Marines more than a, 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 a one that had a political component like this. What is the relative magnitude of the, for, the Marine force as compared to this uh, supporting uh, force that really allied with us? And could the Marines have taken the end bar by themselves? Well, the, I think to answer the second for, uh, question first, no. Um, because they were, it's an economy of force. Anbar is a huge place, and, um, and, 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 and it's an urban battle. Uh, you know, if you go from Fallujah up the Euphrates all the way to the Syrian border, 
uh, it, it was a, a big place to cover. So the, the Marines really needed um, uh, help. Uh, and, and initially, the idea was that, that uh, uh, a reconstituted Iraqi army would have units deployed there. But the, the army that was reconstituting was heavily Shia. So they, 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 that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so the, the, the answer was uh, local, uh, tribal, militias. He uh, and and the, uh, the tribes had these militias, and so they had to be mobilized. Now, um, the way that it would, would, would work is that Marines would take control of an area. They would secure it. And then these tribal militia would become the police. The Marines would be able to protect them against any major push. And, and they would, you know, pacify and secure and hold the area. So you definitely need numbers in, in these, these types of wars. I mean, one of the misconceptions, in, in my own view now, is that um, while uh, the United States um, had a force that was more than adequate uh, to defeat the Iraqi army, um, that force was way under uh, manned uh, for this war after the war. And, uh, and so uh, you, you, you need help. And, uh, and, 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 and that was important. Now, there is a you know, war in politics, right? I mean, war is, and politics and, and are always connected, policy and strategy, uh, taught up the hill here. Uh, and um, uh, this was true in Anbar. The, 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 the political uh, understanding that Marines had to have, and, and cultural understanding, you know, down to um, you know, the platoon level, uh, was very important because uh, they, they had to be able to interact. And this is a different culture, you know, with, um, with a different set of, uh, of, of values. And, uh, and so Marines had to, had to be able to adapt to, uh, to that. Um, one of the, the uh, uh, several senior Marines really got this, but the person who I thought was, was most important, well, a couple, John Kelly. Uh, General Kelly, uh, uh, terrific insight and understanding. Uh, uh, General Allen, General Dunford, um, uh, and, 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 uh, and many others as well. So they, they understood the political dynamics that, were, that had to be understood and, 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 and embraced uh, if they were going to build a force that was able to secure this big area. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, tribal people were mainly uh, Shia. Uh, the well, the tribal people in Anbar are, are Sunnis. Oh, they are. Okay. They're Sunnis. The Shia, yeah. If you look at Iraq, if you look at a, 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 a sort of a, a sectarian uh, in, 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 in tribal or ethnic map, uh, uh, there there are uh, there are areas that are almost exclusively Shia, and that's south of Baghdad. Um, then if you go uh, west of uh, Baghdad, uh, Anbar, and then uh, in some areas above Anbar, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's mainly Sunni. Then uh, further up, it's Kurd. And then there's an area of overlap. Uh, and, uh, and Baghdad is the center of this overlap. So uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Anbar, the, 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 these, were, these were Sunni. And not Shia, they're Arabs, but they're, they're Sunni. And now, um, they're a certain type of, uh, of, uh, of, of Sunni uh, in terms of their view of, uh, of the Quran and, uh, and of the role of religion, which is different than, uh, than uh, the view that, uh, uh, that these uh, Al-Qaeda internationalists had. So, um, you know, complicated terrain. But, but that's, in, in Anbar, it was, uh, it was Sunni. Now they saw, uh, one of the reasons why they, they didn't like the United States uh, was that they saw the U.S. empowering the Shia and putting them in power in Baghdad. So that's a, that's a whole other story, but, but in, in, an important aspect of it. But the tribal people were Sunni and, yeah. and yet they, uh, they helped us. Yeah, because of Al-Qaeda. See, okay. the, you know, Al-Qaeda, Al uh, uh, they, 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 they thought 
that um, their view was that uh, they wanted to institute a certain type of social order and political order in Anbar, um, and that, uh, that, that that was it. And, uh, and so uh, they, they, I call it a power play. They wanted to take over and control this insurgency uh, for their own ends. And, uh, and when, uh, when there was some pushback uh, from, uh, from some of the, uh, the, the sheikhs, uh, they were vicious in, uh, in, uh, in what they did. I mean, it's awful, uh, uh, the, the, the cruelty with which um, they tried to enforce their will. Um, and, and it backfired. I mean, I guess the, the way I understand it is it backfired. And, uh, and so it was an opening uh, if, uh, if this could be exploited. But in order to exploit it, you had to, um, you had to kind of embrace the context you're in. Yes? You think the Sunni and the Shia are ever going to bury the hatchet? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> you know, the, uh, 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 it's become, uh, uh, I had had hope, actually, uh, for Iraq, because um, what, what I think the U.S. was able to accomplish there by 2009 um, was that uh, they, 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 they got these different factions uh, to, um, to lower the violence and to what I, I call cross the bridge from, from uh, armed struggle to political struggle. Now the political struggle, I'm going to take time to, to, to sort out what's the, the political end game for, for Iraq. Um, but uh, uh, unfortunately, and, and now this is my, my assessment of it, I think you had to keep some presence there. We didn't keep presence there, and this uh, this opened. Uh, uh, I think it, it allowed for this sectarianism to come back, and of course um, there is an outside power that's, that's uh, that uh, has been very important in pushing uh, a sectarian fight in, in in Iraq, and that that's Iran. So I don't have an answer to it, um, but uh, the the way things are are going. Uh, in, in, in Iraq and, and, and in Syria. Um, it's not good. It's not good from, from my, my perspective. Yes? If you back up a little bit, and this may be naive on my part, but I'm, tr I'm trying to envision this. We, we go back once upon a time, you had Persia, as it were, in this large area that wasn't, as far as I know, that much part of the World War II, let's say, when there was this huge conflagration. That was, that was too the European area, so now you're breaking into the in-between area, and you've got all these different tribes, almost like um, if you picture American Indians or something, and all their separate tribes and their groups, and suddenly we have these artificial countries established. Yeah. In World War I, actually, actually after World War One. All right, but, all right. That, I mean, that's the... That's when it happened. That's when right. it happened. So, yeah. so I don't know quite how that happened. That's my weakness, I guess. but. Uh, but to try to picture how suddenly you're taking these different tribes and groups of people that have yeah. been able to live by themselves for generations and generations. And you create these countries. Right. And, and then all of a sudden, well, now we've got to get along with one another. We can't just stay in our own section. Uh, we've got to get along, and there's intermarriage, and there's all kinds of stuff happening. And so yeah. they're forced into this artificial situation. Uh, and so you're bound to have, like, essentially, effectively civil wars, are you not? Well, I, I, you, this is really complex. Um, that's, that's all I'm getting at. Yeah, no, you're, it, it, you're, 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 you're <laughs> yeah, no, your question is the right one. Um, and, and, and this goes to how those nations were created in the first place, which was after World War I. And, 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 you know, and under the League of Nations, they created what they called mandates. It was, in many ways, a, a way of colonial powers keeping control of the British and the French over these areas. And they created countries that were, were not homogeneous. But that's true in many parts of the world. You know, if you look at, at the new countries that emerged after World War II, very few were completely homogeneous. Um, so there, there has to be some kind of, of political development that takes place. And unfortunately, you know, the story of, uh, of this region in particular is that that kind of political development, which which means that that, that 
different, uh, different uh, elements uh, uh, come to, uh, uh, to some agreement about common principles and so on. It just didn't happen. You had uh, uh, military dictatorships in, in several of these places. And in Iraq, um, uh, the, the Ba'athists were, were in power for quite a long time. They represented one particular uh, part of this, uh, this makeup. And, uh, and so, you know, you have a history of, uh, of, of this uh, confrontation. And this is not easy, uh, easy to, uh, to sort out. Sure. Yeah. Did the rules of engagement uh, create, create a problem for the Marines? Well, you know, the, what the Marines, of course, uh, realized was that um, you, uh, you can't stay in, uh, you know, you can't commute to the war. This is what the trains used to say. And you have to, uh, you know, you have to put uh, yourself in, in, on the ground and stay there. And, uh, and so this, um, this, this had a problem. Of course, this uh, uh, can undermine force protection. Uh, and, um, and and and, uh, and yeah, it, it, it had a, the rules of engagement um, were were an important issue because of course we we think about uh, conflict uh, we want to limit our casualties but in these sorts of wars um, you have to engage in the population and so uh, it, it's hard and then how you use force it, it, it's also a big issue uh, you know and and. and the other side is good at trying to, uh, to, to get you to do things that, uh, that hurt your reputation uh, because they fight in and among the population. So rules of engagement in these kinds of conflicts, very, very hard. Uh, and um, uh, it's something that the Marine Corps had to deal with. Has the, has the climate in Avar uh, been fairly stable recently or have we lost everything? That we no, had? it's terrible in Anbar. You know, what you had is, um, is, uh, is uh, Al-Qaeda coming back. Um, there's, uh, it, 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 it's not good. Um, and and it's, it kind of illustrates what's happening uh, uh, now uh, in Syria and Iraq together. So there's a, a wider uh, fight that's taking place, but no, Anbar is not good, and and and, and it's unclear whether um, whether uh, the Iraqi government can uh, can get control of, of that area. Um, you know, I, I was I love Skype you know, because you can Skype with everyone, and I, I spent a lot of time Skyping with the former uh, National Security Advisor of Iraq, uh, and uh, we were he was saying uh, about two weeks ago that. Um, uh, Getting, uh, getting their hands around that situation is, uh, is, is very difficult for them. Yes? <clears throat> to carry that a little bit of different direction, when we first went in there, and we simply gone in, said to the Iraqis, as soon as we get Saddam and the rest of the 12 most wanted in our deck of cards, and make sure there's no guns of deep floating around, we're out of here. Yeah. And we had done that. What do you think the state of Iraq would be today? Yeah, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, um, but this is what I hear from uh, from some of the Iraqis that I've dealt with over the years, that um, that that's what, what we, we should have done. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we did things that um, made withdrawing um, difficult because of the, the, the disbanding of the the Iraqi army, the disbanding of the government. You know, we, we, we created, we, we facilitated uh, instability. The year 2003, in, in, now in my uh, book, I, call, I, I characterize US policy in Iraq in 2003, really, uh, from you know, the takedown of the government. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, my title is All the Wrong Moves. And, and, and I, I, you know, of course, writers like that, you have to have some you know, catchy chapter titles. <laughs> um, but in, in many ways, um, you, could, you could look at U.S. policy in, in Iraq in 2003, um, after the, the fall of the regime, as, as doing things that, that made it hard to get out. You know, we, we actually, I mean, that was Rumsfeld's plan, you know, to have 
tear everyone out by, by August of, uh, of 2003. Yeah, months, <laughs> you know, several years down the road. It's kind of like the, you know, the Kaiser who said everyone will be home by November. And they were, but it was four years later. <laughs> and, and, and the same with uh, Mission So I think that, that uh, we, we made some mistakes there. Um, uh, could what you know? What if we had done that? I, that's you know uh, counterfactual. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that what we did there in 2003 uh, facilitated um, this insurgency, and um, we paid the price. For it. And the Iraqis paid a big price. Are the Marines still there? Uh, we're out, you know, we're out. Now there's some talk, you know, that because of this awful situation in, uh, uh, in, in Syria, now it's, it's creeping down in, into, into Iraq, and there, there has been uh, some discussion recently about uh, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, put some forces back in Iraq. I don't expect it because I, I think that, um, the, uh, the, the, that Washington approach this war uh, in Iraq is not our war. And, and so um, I can't imagine uh, them uh, re-engaging uh, there. Uh, yes? Suppose, suppose we'd gone ahead in the first Gulf War to Baghdad. Do you think that would have? Yeah. I don't know. Um, that, that I've studied that war quite a bit. And, and uh, what was what's so interesting about that that war was that two of our allies really were were, were, were so strong uh, against us doing that, and they were important allies. One was Saudi Arabia, and the other was Turkey. It just seems that we leave these wars when they're half done. Yeah. Then we have to go back. Well, uh, in that case, uh, we um, uh, I think we thought we could use tools that would would contain that situation and, and, and we deal with um, uh, the big question, uh, which, um, which was the WMD question in, in 1991. And, uh, if you look at the, the UN um, uh, agreement that was signed, one important aspect of that was that uh, inspectors were supposed to be able to have free and unfettered access uh, so that you could ensure that, uh, that the uh, chemical and biological and nuclear weapons would be uh, would go. And, and of course, uh, the problem with, uh, with that is that um, uh, the UN didn't control the ground. And so uh, uh, Saddam was able to, uh, uh, to, to keep that issue uh, from being resolved, which becomes uh, an issue in 2000, after 2001, all of a sudden, uh, Iraqi weapons of mass destruction uh, become the basis for uh, uh, intervening in Iraq. So, you know, not having uh, solved that problem uh, in the aftermath of the war uh, ends up being a, a precipitant of the, the key uh, factor uh, for the, the intervention in uh, in, uh, in 2003. So, it, you know, in, in many ways, these wars are connected in, in ways that, um, uh, that uh, you know, if, if you had resolved the WMD question, then um, the, 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 or the rationale for uh, intervening in Iraq, which turned out to be, of course, not true. Uh, there, there, there was no WMD, but um, the assumption was that Other questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>